Hello and welcome to Unramblings, a podcast about stories and storytelling. I'm Mark. And I'm Charlene. And this week we're talking about Disney Pixar's new film Onward, which has been released early to streaming services because we're not allowed outside anymore. We did post a little bit on social media. We had posted a full schedule a little bit before our unplanned hiatus. We've decided to diverge from that a little bit, partially because of just how things have gone in our own lives with time to read, etc. But also just to put a few things in here that are a little bit lighter and a bit more fun, um, as I think people probably need their spirits lifting a bit more and a little bit less talk about toxic masculinity and capitalism. Well, no, we're still going to talk about that. But in a more fun environment, let's go with that. Yeah, for anybody listening to this farther away from when it was posted, this is early to mid-April. Uh, it's actually April 11th, so we're in Today. the... To, as we're recording, so it's still the middle of the sheltering in place, self-isolating, social distancing, whatever stuff going on with the novel coronavirus situation, so... I worry that that middle is going to sound very optimistic six months from now. But Well, we're currently doing that whole shelter-in-place, yeah. staying socially distant, etc. stuff. And we know a lot of other people are doing the same, which is good. And so, yeah, didn't want to pile on to dark thoughts and ambient stress with more dark thoughts and stressful content. We're still going to be doing a little bit of that, but... We'll switch it up a little bit and throw some lighter things in there. It was, it was a schedule of just stressful things at one point. So, Okay, so as we did with our episode on Birds of Prey, as this is a newer, more recently released film, we're going to do a brief spoiler-free review of it first, um, and then you can decide if you want to go and watch it before you get into the spoilery plot summary that we'll do afterwards. Not to mention the completely full of spoilers discussion that we'll have, totally unpicking a bunch of details that you probably would prefer to experience through watching the movie. Yes. So Onward follows two brothers in a sort of fantasy world where magic has existed but is now largely forgotten and has been replaced with technology. The family is mostly elves, there's a centaur running around, etc. But there's also cars and such. So it's a fun world to begin with. The brother's father passed away when they were both very young, or I think before one of them was born. And on the younger brother's 16th birthday, they receive um, a magic spell that their father has left them that would enable them to bring him into the world for a day so that they could meet him when they were older. And then everything moves forward from there. Right. That's how the adventure sort of begins. It's a very sweet and like touching movie that has a lot of emotional content that's it's not like traumatically emotional but it's more touching emotional yeah very much about family and things like that and the importance of family in different ways and uh i think is done very well there are some interesting storytelling choices that i think we'll get into more when we were talking with more spoilers but it is definitely a good movie i wouldn't say it is the best of pixar's movies at least to me like it was not my favorite but it was very good and I think would definitely be appropriate for children of most ages, I would say. And well, adults, obviously. I don't think I have a uh, specific ranking of Pixar films. I, I certainly enjoyed it. Um, it's it's fun, but also sad, but also heartwarming. So, you know, it strikes a nice balance, I think. Sure. When I say it's not like my absolute favorite of the Pixar movies, like every time I watch Wally, I like kind of immediately just want to watch it again. And I don't have that reaction with Onward, but I do like it and I, I like the story that it tells. And it definitely did get me teary eyed at a few different points. You know, it does, yeah. it is a very effective emotional story in, in getting to you. Yeah. Okay. So here we're going to cut it off and say we're going to go into spoiler territory now. So we're about to enter a point where we are going to spoil the entirety of the plot of the film. We're also going to drop in any other spoilers or potential content warnings that we might have right about here. Hello, we're very light on spoiler warnings this week. I believe that the only thing that we talk about is the movie Coco, just in some of the ways that it's similar. And as far as content warnings, mainly just the one you would expect seeing the premise of the film. We talk about grief and loss, the death of a parent, that kind of thing, just because it's a major theme in the movie. Okay, and back to the past. Welcome back. So to follow on from our spoiler-free summary and review, we cut off there with they get the spell from their dad. Well, they try to use the spell to bring him back for a day, but accidentally break like the focus instrument thing that they 
need to have in order to complete the spell, and so it only generates their dad from his feet to his waist. And so they have this animate dad's legs with them. But the spell will only last for a single day, so they have a single day to find a replacement artifact to complete the spell and be able to take advantage of the rem- whatever remains of that day. And so this spawns their quest to go and find the Phoenix Gem, which is the focus object, and they essentially kind of run away from home a little bit. To They go off on this adventure without telling their mom, who then is following after her with a manticore quest beast character and her boyfriend, who is a police officer and a centaur who are all just trying to make sure that they're safe and not going to die because they know that when the boys find the phoenix gem, it will generate a cursed dragon. And they don't, the boys don't know that, but the parents do. So they're trying to catch up to them in time. And that's pretty much the rest of the plot of the movie. Eventually, they do find the phoenix gem, but it's like right before the sunset. So there isn't actually really a lot of time with their dad. And Ian is trapped where he can't actually talk to their dad and only sees the opportunity his brother has to say goodbye to their father. And that's, I think, the whole plot yeah. summary. Like, yeah. There's some sort of side parts there that build up, but uh, that's the main plot, certainly. I mean, obviously, a big part of the movie is about the relationship between the two brothers as they're on this quest, and they get to know each other a lot better and realize how important they are in each other's lives at Particularly, Ian realizes the paternal role that his older brother has had in his life. So, it's an important part of the narrative. I don't know if it's fair to say that they get to know each other better. They just sort of start to see each other in different lights, I think. I think they do get to know each other better because Ian didn't know that Barley had refused to see their dad when he was dying in the hospital. Yeah. And that was something that Barley had just sort of been carrying with him the whole time, but had never really been vulnerable about And Ian sort of viewed Barley as kind of a screw-up and realized later that he wasn't. He was actually the person who was there for him and acting in all the capacities that Ian would have wanted their father to be able to do. Yeah. So I I feel like that's getting to know him better. Okay, that's fair. Okay, so into our main conversation. Mm -hmm. So I I think it makes sense to start off talking a bit about the world-building that takes place in the film. I agree. Because we get this sort of intro narration that shows this fantasy world where people can do magic um, and then shows like someone who's not very good at magic finding out about the invention of electricity and the light bulb and just being like, this is so easy. And then we fast forward to the future where everyone just uses technology in their cars and such. In a weird way, one of the big plot building things, I think, is a sort of D&D style game, like a role- tabletop role playing game that Barley plays. And card and like a collectible card game like Uh, magic the gathering as well like it's both of those because you see his map with his minis that's clearly like his DD type game based on the world that was you know the world of magic and manticores and stuff and then also his collectible card game cards that look very much like magic the gathering cards that are also referencing the same historical abilities and artifacts and stuff yeah which is that point which like it's it is based on the history of that world, like it's factually accurate. Right. So it's sort of D and D, but also historical reenactment. Right. It's. I think it's more like when people like set up ancient battles, and it's like ah, uh, the Thirteenth Legion, and like you know the Battle of Thermopylae, and things like that. Like people modeling those on a map, or making a game like Risk or something, or one of the many games that is supposed to sort of replicate major wars and battles in our history. Um, So it's more like that, but it looks to us like fantasy games. Yeah, because so much of that history has been forgotten by the main populace, it's an interesting way of having that exposition for how the world was and what this is and that and the other, in that really you have this character who is presented as kind of a dork, And has this opportunity to go, ah, well, like, it's because of this. And, like, people going, well, it's just your dumb game. He's like, no, 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 this is real. (laughs) Like, this is all, like, very factual. Mm -hmm. Um, They did their research. Right. And people are skeptical because we don't take games seriously or trust them to be well-researched and grounded in facts. But I don't know. I think it's sort of like if somebody 
stumbled onto like a tomb that hadn't been excavated yet, but they happened to be like a huge Egyptology buff or something. And they're like, no, these symbols mean this stuff. And it's like, that's just from that like stupid reenactment thing that you like. And it's like, no, that stuff is all based on actual tombs and actual burial practices and mythology. And they're like, well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting from a storytelling point of view with, a sort of meta level of it being set in a fantasy world that we might play a game set in, but there's someone playing a game set in that fantasy world within the fantasy world. Yeah. And it gives them some um, shorthands, sort of like we talked about with Wally, how mm. they were able to use some of the tropes from romantic films to have a romantic relationship develop just without any speech. With this, you sort of are able to build a fantasy world by being like, it's like these games. Right. Um, we know how some things are going to work because... That's how they work in other things. And I won't come back to that in a minute, but I do want to mention that uh, the Manticore mm -hmm. character is interesting for that. Right. Um, we come across the Manticore in the... Is it, is it the Manticore's Tavern? Mm -hmm. Which they go to for the quest, and Bali's like, oh yeah, because it's the place from the from back in the day. And you sort of turn up and you're expecting it to be a you know, rough tavern, and it's effectively, you said, a Chuck E. Cheese? Yeah, that's, it, that's exactly what it's a takeoff of, is Chuck E. Cheese. Yeah. Which, for anyone who's never been to a Chuck E. Cheese, good for you. <laughs> well, thank you. But the Manticore is still there, um, and has now become a restaurant manager concerned with uh, taxes and such. Liability. Liability claims. But that's a character that seems to have just existed. Like, it's not, this is the current Manticore. This is just the Manticore that has always been the runner of this tavern in some form or another. Which suggests that the, she has managed to live in both the past fantasy world and the current technological world. We tried to do the math on how many years must have passed for that, and I don't think we came down on a concrete number. A few hundred, though. Yeah, it's hard to say because the period of time between modern-ish day, which is sort of what's being depicted, and the light bulb. The light bulb was developed around the turn of the century, right? Let's fact check that. I want to say it was around the turn of the century, like give or take 20 years. I think maybe the late 1800s. Eh? First patent filed in 1879. Go me! Late 1800s. Yeah, so the span of time between then and now is like 150 years. Which 140. is around, like 150, yeah. around 150 years, give or take. So that's not actually that long in the span of like fantasy creature lifespans. Yeah. At least if we're assuming it's similar fantasy creature lifespans to the ones in our fantasy games, which there's no actual concrete reason to assume that, except they're drawing all these parallels. Yeah. But if that was the case, you'd expect the elves to live for hundreds of years, which means their mom and dad would have lived in that historical world. Well, they could just be young elves. They could be, but their parents, you know, like, there would still be a lot of creatures who had started their lives hundreds of years before the dawn of electricity, and this is all very recent to them. But it doesn't seem that way as far as the characters that we encounter through the story, like the pixies who think it's crazy to be told that they used to be able to fly, that pixies used to be able to fly. Like, they don't remember that being a thing, which indicates to me that that's something that was several generations back. Same sort of a thing with the skepticism that a lot of people have toward Barley's games as being, like, just a game and not reflective of reality. That, again, tells me that this is generations ago, which would sort of mean that it took hundreds and hundreds of years between Lightbulb and Skyscraper, which is a little weird to me. Well, I mean, it depends on where your priorities lie, and you don't know how long it would take to catch on. But I mean, the other thing is that also the portrayal of civilization in the early scenes is small village hamlets, mm -hmm. and you've progressed to giant cities. When light bulb was inventive, I mean, there were already cities. So. That's true. Point being, we tried to figure out how long it probably was between the opening of like the world full of magic and the present day, quote unquote, that the movie is set in. And the answer is, we don't know. <laughs> it's very unclear. You could really make an argument either way for it being fairly recent or hundreds or thousands of years. Also, when they're inventing the light bulb, they don't yet seem to have invented the wheel. I don't think we see any wheels in that first section as well. So it's not like there are already horse-drawn buggies or anything. I don't know about that, but 
Anyway. anyway. But no, I mean, it makes the Manticore an interesting character and yeah. um, from a storytelling perspective. I feel like she might be a lightly missed opportunity in that you only really get the couple of vague references to before from her. Mm-hmm. But it's a, it's a fun thing and we might get into that a little bit as we go on. Yeah, but I do appreciate that there is very definitely a character who lived through the previous age of magic spells and wizards and cursed dragons and quests who also has seen that entire world transition over to a world of cars and skyscrapers and concrete high schools. And largely adapted in various ways. Yeah. Some, some, some better than others. But who, when upon realizing the ways that she's adapted, is not happy with the person she's become. Yeah. So I was talking about some of the things that they borrow from D&D style games as sort of a bit of a shorthand to let us know what's going on in places. It's interesting how they build a party, as it were, for their adventure. Mm-hmm. Um, and how you see some people falling into less typical roles than you might expect. Ian is fairly obviously a wizard. He has a staff. Although I think there's an argument that he could be a sorcerer because he has innate power. He has innate power. He has no training. Yeah. A wizard learns magic through careful and ongoing study over years and years and years and discipline. Okay. So. Sorcerer has an innate ability. But it's hard to say because he, sorcerers have an innate ability that's going to come out either way, and he, his is triggered by the staff and using a spell. So if it, it were really like a clear delineation that he was 100% sorcerer, then there would be like weird magic stuff happening whether he wanted it to or not. Anyway. Point being, he's that like glass cannon magic user. Yes. Bali is built in such a way that like at first you might expect him to be a warrior. He like a fighter character because like when you first see him he's very stocky and aggressive and then he's like jumping out of the van with his sword and his helmet on because that's who he is as a person i don't know that he's aggressive he's more playful but he's very rambunctious like sure he's very he's like a big puppy he like comes in and like grabs his mom and and his brother and like sort of wrestles with them a little bit like and catches them off guard which could read as aggressive but i read it as very playful yeah very physical, though, is I think what you're saying. Yes. Yeah, that's a good opening. So you sort of expect him to grow into that, but he does sort of take on this role of bard um, as he knows all of the lore and he's much more sort of a... He specs to support other characters and give them the backup that they need. Yeah, he, his main skill, bardic inspiration and bardic knowledge are like the things that Barley uses on the quest. Also, his name is Barley and it's Bard. I don't think that's an accident. No. And I mean... Um, I think it's worth talking about Barley for a moment as a character, as he gets portrayed very much as kind of a fuck up. Mm-hmm. I don't think that they use the word fuck up. They use the screw up, I think, in the screw movie. Up, yes. Which I think is kind of unfair, and I think within the context of the culture of the film, is kind of leaning heavily on these things because he is more into what is quote the arts. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he's a history dork. Yeah, no, I definitely agree, especially because he's so young. Like, it's really unfair to be like, oh, this kid's never getting, never going to go anywhere when he's maybe 18 or 19 years old. Like, his mom says, like, mutters, like, something about longest gap year ever. And we disagreed on what that might mean. You said you thought maybe it was more than one year. Like, he's, he's taken a gap year that's turned into more than a year. But I think that it's just because he's been getting into trouble because he's protesting the removal of ancient artifacts and stuff around town that he's been a bit of a headache for her. And so it feels like a long time. So I think he's probably, like, 18 or 19 years old. And... No one really has it together at that point. And also, he's a 18 or 19-year-old who's grown up without a father, like, with a single parent, trying to keep an eye on his little brother. And his hobbies are playing fantasy games and protesting the removal of historically significant artifacts. Like, I don't think that's a kid who's screwed up. I think that's a very passionate and sensitive kid, honestly. Yeah. The film obviously goes some way to saying that he's not a screw-up. Right. But it takes them a while to get there. And it does, like, go, how do we portray this person as a screw-up? Well, you know, turns to the arts and history. And I might have a mild issue with <laughs> that as a take on things. Um, so so maybe docking them a couple of points for that decision. But I understand how they get there. And well, I think what they're initially trying to do is show you how Ian perceives him and how he's misunderstood by other people in his life. Mm, that's Sh- Like, showing how Colt, the police officer and mother's boyfriend who 
is constantly called to be like, get your girlfriend's son away from this fountain, please. Because he says every time Barley is getting into disagreements with the law, like he has to deal with it. And I and I'm guessing that's true. They're like, okay, yeah, he's a kid, but like also he's our boss's not quite stepson. So like, just handle this, please. And so it's a drain for him, and it's a hassle for his mom, and he's embarrassing to his little brother. And so I think it's trying to show you through their eyes how they're seeing him as just sort of annoying and a problem, basically. It does beg the question of how Colt and their mom met. Eh. It was because Barley chained himself to the fountain again or something. Yeah. That that seems canonically viable to me, <laughs> is that, like, they met because of that. And I do want to say, like, I going back and thinking about it, I think you're right that I think Barley probably is just 19 or so. Mm-hmm. Because in the pictures where Ian is fairly newborn, mm-hmm. he would probably be about three in that. Assuming that the elves in this age in a human style of aging in their early years. But we don't know how long the years are in high school and stuff for them, too. So, like, how long a year is, etc. on this planet. I was going to say that there's no argument to say otherwise, but I suppose that it's... Uh, Different it's planet. Two, two moons or two yeah. suns, which one is it? Two moons. Yeah. It's two moons, so it's definitely a different planet. We don't know how long the year is, or how long 16 years is. You could really get into the weeds with that. Point being, he does seem to be, like, if you're assuming human ages, Barley is maybe three or four years older than Ian. Yeah. Young enough that when he saw his dad hooked up to, like, support stuff in the hospital, he was too scared to go and say goodbye to him. Yeah. And that's a very young child thing, I think. So going back to the party that we were talking about ten minutes ago. Right. Barley is the bard. <laughs> yes. Ian is wizard slash sorcerer. And then I think that they cast the mother as a sort of warrior fighter character. I mean, she calls herself a warrior at one mm-hmm. point. So. Yeah. Um, which is a nice take and nicely foreshadowed as well. Yeah. And I also like how that works as far as her being their remaining parent who's role has been to protect them and to draw the aggro of the world away from them because she's their mother. Yeah. And so she's ultimately the one who slays the dragon and stuff, like, or at least holds it off, holds it off while they're pursuing the Phoenix gem and the spell to bring their father back. And I think Ian is ultimately the one who drives the sword in with magic, but she's the one who enables them to get to yeah. that point and incapacitates the dragon enough that that's possible. Yeah, I mean, she works very hard to retrieve the sword right. to give Ian the tools to defeat the dragon. It's a whole yeah. coming of age thing right there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, Elliot, it, it's very cute, too, because at the very opening when we're first introduced to the family, she's doing, like, a exercise workout video thing where it's where she's chanting to herself that she is a powerful warrior and then that has a nice callback when she's fighting the dragon and she's like i'm a powerful warrior <laughs> it's very adorable uh, and then finally you have uh i mean he's sort of tangentially part of the party but colt the yeah. police officer who I, I think you know maybe i'm being lazy to say it but a paladin no i think that's fair and also works with what tends to happen in the party where like the paladin is not really doing what the party needs to be doing because they're too stuck on what they're supposed to do and what their role is and their responsibility is it's the party where they're like okay so we just got to break into this place and steal this artifact and the paladin goes no we can't do that it's illegal (laughs) yeah exactly (laughs) but the fate of the world yes but it's illegal (laughs) right his heart is in the right place but he's very constrained by what he knows his role is and what he's supposed to do. And he's like, no, I'm going to gotta bring you back to your mom. That's the thing I'm supposed to do as a police officer and as your mother's boyfriend. <laughs> if the paladin from our D&D group is listening, please disregard everything. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, you know, parental roles is obviously a fairly central part of this film as it's about someone trying to reconnect with their father. Or connect for the first time, really. Because with Barley, the thing is, he did know their father, but only when he was very young. And he never said goodbye to him. And that seems to be, like, the big thing for him. And for Ian, it's that he never met their father because he hadn't been born yet when he died. So it's both of them trying to have something neither of them ever had, which is to know their father, like, at a point where they could know they were knowing him, if that makes sense. Yeah. I think there's a really 
important sort of throwaway line at one point where we've been following Ian for so long and Ian keeps being like, we've got to do this because we've got to meet Dad. Mm-hmm. Like, well, I've got to do this because I've got to meet Dad. And mm-hmm. then Barley just has a moment where he's like, you know I want to see him too, right? Yeah, that one was pretty painful. But I feel like it moves on from that very quickly without really addressing the line. I think they address it later when yeah. they have the conversation about it turns out like Barley has never told Ian that he has a fourth memory of their father when their father was dying. Yeah. And he's never talked to Ian about it because I think he didn't want to add something painful to Ian's idea of their father. I think there's also an extent to which he was ashamed of the fact that he was scared. Definitely. That's also definitely a he, part of it. He says like, and I decided I was never going to be scared again, which is not healthy. Uh Right, that's true. But I think that, I think you're right. I think part of it is that he's ashamed that he gave up that chance to say goodbye and see their father because he was scared. But that's pretty hard on himself, though, because he was a very small child and that sort of situation is incredibly intimidating. And there's a lot of emotional weight there. Like, it's an overwhelming situation for much older people who are much more emotionally developed than someone who is probably five at the oldest you know, and from what you see of, like, the photos yeah. around that time. So it's one of those things where you want that character to have more compassion for themselves. It's like, you're being really unfair. <laughs> but I also do think there's a part of it because he tells Ian about the other memories he has of their dad, but not of that one. And I do think part of it is he doesn't want to give Ian the worst part of having known their dad. So it's very easy to see the film as being a story about in hunting for a father figure Mm -hmm. and he's got this sort of like idea of one and I think it's very telling that you only end up with this pair of legs Mm -hmm. and he has this sort of idea that this pair of legs is his father figure but has no idea of what the full thing would be like Mm -hmm. um can't see that or interact with it really except in an extremely limited way that has to be contextualized by Barley like even the things that the legs can do that are indicative of their father and his personality Barley has to tell him about, like, the dancing and, like, the the playing the drums on the feet thing. Yeah. And the socks that the feet are wearing that um, he was told about by his dad's college friend. Yeah. Everything he knows from those legs that's meaningful is mediated by someone else, which is consistent with his experience of his father before generating those legs. And you have the earlier scene where he's like looking at the pictures of his dad and playing a recording of his dad and pretending to have a conversation. Mm -hmm. The fact that the legs can't speak, I think is, Mm -hmm. I mean, apart from anything else, it would be weird. I think it's very clever storytelling wise that they're only able to be accompanied by the least interactive part of their father, because I think that says something important about death and grief and the fact that you really can't interact in a full way with someone who has died. And also the fact that, like, it becomes almost a burden on their journey. Mm-hmm. A one that they wouldn't give up and that they take with them everywhere and enjoy aspects of, mm-hmm. but still something that they have to carry with them, effectively. Mm-hmm. But you, yeah, anyway, so you get sort of Ian's main storyline where you've got that quest for the father, and then Bali has this sort of background storyline where he's the one that is actually trying to do what you expect, which is to say goodbye and like have an opportunity for that last moment to not be the moment where he ran away. So I forget whether we mentioned it earlier, but as Ian's story progresses, he realizes that his list of things that he wants to do with his dad, they are actually all things that like Barley has stood in for and that Barley is effectively taking on that role and has been encouraging him in the way that a father figure would and is effectively his father figure. Right. That the things that he wants out of a meeting with his father, he already has through his relationship with his brother and the support of his brother. Yeah. He does all the things, you know, he Mm -hmm. motivates, he Mm -hmm. consoles, he embarrasses. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. And says the things that are hard to hear, like with the merging thing, like Ian is so terrified to learn how to drive and he's very scared to merge onto the interstate. He keeps saying he's not ready, like in class, he ends up having to pull over because he's too overwhelmed. And when he's in that situation with Barley, Barley is the one who says, you're never going to be ready. You just have to do it. I'm paraphrasing. But he does say, literally, you're never going to be ready. And that's something that a parent has to tell you in that situation. Someone who you trust and who knows you is the best vector for that kind of thing that you need to hear. It's not comforting, but it helps you kind of get past that roadblock in your mind. Yeah. 
So at the end of the film, Barley does get that opportunity. And Ian, recognising that he actually already has what he needs, gives Barley that moment and to go and, and goes and fights the dragon instead, as, <laughs> as you do. Um, In order to enable Barley to have yeah. the moment that he needs. Which um, means that the only time you actually see the father is from Ian's perspective of Barley having that interaction at a distance. And it's not even very clear. It's mostly like a... Because they're standing like in front of a sunset, it's sort of a silhouette of their father that's sort of lined in light and looks very ethereal and doesn't really look like a person. Like the details, you can't really see his face or anything like that. You can't really make out any more than you could imagine, honestly. I think it's, again, it's part of that reflection of you can't actually meet someone you've never met. Yeah. Not even magic is allowing him to do that. And I do really appreciate that that's how they handle the father coming back and like the end of the quest, because throughout the movie, I was kind of wondering, okay, how are they going to pull this off? Because there, there's a lot of buildup with the entire movie centering around bringing back the rest of their father, the top half, so they can have some time with him. And I was thinking during the movie, there's no way that any interaction that they have between the father and the boys on screen is going to have enough of an emotional payoff for all of the work they are doing, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, like, how are they going to do this and have it not fall flat or be anticlimactic in some way? But at the same time, also thinking, but they can't just have it not work because that's devastating in a different way and would be unsatisfying as a story conclusion in another way. So I was really impressed by the way that they chose to do it where you watch the scene of the reunion happening from a distance through Ian's perspective through the perspective of someone who can't really see it that well and is not there can't hear what's happening can't see the details never actually meets him but is still able to know that he did something for his brother that he enabled his brother to have a moment that he really needed and was going to be more meaningful than anything else that he could have had yeah. At the same time, I also kind of, because the mom was following them the whole time, sort of expected her to be there for that reunion, even though I knew the reunion couldn't really work. So it's weird how it, how this movie sort of built contradicting expectations and conjecture in my yeah. mind. I've been thinking about it, and I think that the fact that the mother isn't doesn't have a reunion there makes a lot of sense for the themes of what you need and what that would be able to give in that Ian isn't there because he doesn't need that. He doesn't need to have that father figure for five minutes because he's got a father figure. For but, his whole life. Right. Laurel doesn't need to be part of that because, I mean, she clearly loved their father, mm -hmm. um, but also has closure on the matter. Mm -hmm. She presumably did get to say goodbye to him and, like, was clearly sad, but the way that she talks about him and the fact that she's in a relationship with Colt shows that, like, that was a part of her life and she has moved on from that and has accepted all of that. Mm -hmm. uh, she wouldn't gain anything from time with their father at this point, or at least not for five minutes. Mm -hmm. It would just be reopening an old wound. Mm -hmm. She wants it for them, but yeah. she doesn't seem to really want it for herself. Yeah. And, like, she seems a little bit reticent about the whole thing from the beginning when they're trying to cast a spell to bring him back. But at the same time, she's there. Like, she, oh, she... waits all day while Barley tries over and over and over. And and I do think, going back to that, having seen the rest, the whole movie, the fact that it is Barley who's trying and trying and trying over and over and over and not really tiring of it at all. Eventually, I think their mom is like, okay, we've Let's call it, like, I think that's their mom who intervenes is like, okay, honey, if it didn't try, the, if it didn't work the first 30 times for the last eight hours or whatever, it's, let's give us a rest. It's not going to work right now. Let's, you know, let's stop. Um, at that point, I'm sure it's very painful for her to watch. It's clearly painful for Ian to watch, but he never tries. He sort of tries accidentally after they've left the room yeah. and it's not something he's doing on purpose. And I do think that's partially because he doesn't necessarily know what he is missing like he knows that something is missing he knows there is a presence that it was not in his life that should have been in his life and that other people would expect to have in their lives and so i think he feels that but not having known their father he doesn't miss him in the same in the same way yeah. that barley does where he's trying to recapture something that was torn away from him before he was ready yeah 
And also speaking before about, you know, the expectations that you might have from the way the movie kind of starts and progresses until the sort of surprise ending where Ian doesn't actually get to meet their father. I appreciate that the big emotional payoff is Ian realizing that his older brother has been the one looking out for him and doing all the things that he wanted to have out of time with their dad. Not necessarily instead of, but as opposed to the sort of 90s era special episode type of storyline where the child of a single parent who has missed their other parent, never knew them or whatever, uh, realizes that their remaining parent is both parents or is enough or, you know, was in both roles all along. You know, they're taking their mom to the father-daughter dance or whatever that is, or giving their dad a card on Mother's Day. You know, I think we've all seen those movies and those television episodes. I mean, I haven't, but I believe you. Okay, well, it was something that I definitely remember being a thing in, like, children's programming when I was growing up in the 90s. I think I must have missed that. that. Okay, well, you're (laughs) younger than I am, so maybe it was just, like, offset for you in terms of when you were watching these programs. But So, like, there was a part of me having watched that trope play out so many times that was sort of expecting her to get there and maybe it to not work because I didn't really think they could show a reunion between the father and the boys and have it emotionally work like I was saying before. So I think a part of me sort of expected their mother to be there and for them to realize, you know, that she was enough and that that all the things that they wanted their father to do, she had been doing for them. So I, I thought it was interesting that they managed to subvert that expectation as well as so many others. That we were talking about before. I think it's worth noting that it is a nice portrayal of a single parent household. Because the big problem that they have is, ugh, mum's boyfriend's kind of a dork. Mm. Um, And he he acts like this. And they mock him for that. And that's that's one thing. But there's... But they don't, like, hate him or anything. No. And there's not a point at which you're shown that there is something especially lacking in that household. There's this idea of... I wish I'd met my dad because that's, like, he's a person I've heard about and I would like to meet him. And there are certain things that you're expected to do with your dad. Mm -hmm. There's never an implication that, you know, Laurel won't take Ian for a driving lesson. Mm -hmm. Um, It's possible that nobody taught Barley to drive. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But, like, it's not as though... They're, go- they're going, like, Laurel really can't ha- ha- hold it together. Like, what's our mom doing? You know, mm-hmm. you know, like, there needs to be another person. Like, she is enough. Mm-hmm. But their dad was someone who existed. Mm-hmm. And they want to know more about him. And they want him to know who they are. And I think that was a big part of it. That's why he wrote the spell. He yeah. wanted to know yeah. who his sons grew up to be. So it's partly about him getting to know who they became and also them getting to show him who they became. So, yeah. Yeah, not necessarily because they need him for something in their lives as far as to be okay and healthy individuals. They are okay and healthy individuals. They are a healthy family, despite the loss. Yeah. Is there anything else you want to add about parental roles? Since you brought it up, it is nice that in showing this healthy single-parent household where, like, the father died some time ago when the kids were young and the mother has moved on that like the mother's boyfriend isn't a bad guy like he is an obstacle at some points during their story but he or during their adventure but he is as you say he's just sort of a dork they make fun of him a little bit but they don't think he's bad they don't think that he's bad for their mother he's never mean to them like he's a little frustrated about barley constantly getting arrested for protesting and stuff and like because he ends up getting, like, looped into that. And you can see why he might be exasperated a bit with Barley when you see, like, that his van is, like, full of parking citations that he's clearly never paid. So, like, I can see him being kind of, like, exasperated by Barley's disregard for certain rules that he feels are unjust or arbitrary. But he doesn't, like, hate the kids or anything. He's never mean to them. He's just a little bit like, ugh. In a way that's very relatable that any parent might do. But he's... A good person. Yeah. He clearly loves their mother and things like that. And I think that there's an extent to which it's a very sort of in the background plot, but 
Colt, which, for the record, a hilarious name for a centaur. His name is Colt Bronco, <laughs> which is just... I missed his last yes! name. Yes! Oh my god, really? How did you miss that? Yeah, it's Colt Bronco, and then it's Officer Bronco. Oh, it is, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. He doesn't, at the start of the film, seem to put much value in what the kids think or do. Um, like, he's shown, like, coming into the house and very much sort of knocking their stuff over and, like, pushing all of Barley's stuff aside so that he can sit at the table, which is a ridiculous way for a horse to sit down. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, centre, not a horse, obviously. Um, but you do get, like, in that opening scene, one of the things that happens is Barley is saying... You know, centaurs used to be able to run 70 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. And he's like, well, I don't need to run. I've got a car. Mm -hmm. But by the end, like, there's a more acceptance of magic, but it is also a reflection of the bond that has been built with the kids over the course of the chasing them. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) That he does also, at that point, like, not take his car to work and instead has his ridiculous running off scene. I think it's To, like, Baby I Was Born to Run, like, reference there is very fun. Um, The long flowing hair that you don't necessarily expect (laughs) Or see until that point. Has to have a mane, obviously. But I think it's the mustache combination Mm. that doesn't work for it. I I don't think that you see a lot of bearded centaurs in fantasy work. I mean, I see very few centaurs at all in the usual world. I think in fantasy work you do see bearded centaurs, but I don't think you see just mustached. Mm. That, like, um, Burt Reynolds mustache, like, centaur. Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe centaurs with soul patches need to (laughs) go. Anyway, um... But, I mean, there's a few other things as well where they're, like, he seems to take in more of what the kids are saying and there seems to be building the relationship there. I'm sorry. Well, I think part of it, too, is I don't know how aware he seems to be of the fact that by being in a serious relationship with their mother, he is becoming a parent to her kids. Yeah. And that ends up coming up not to him, but in the conversation where Ian and Barley are pretending to be him through with an illusion spell, and one of the officers is like, oh, like, I get why you're kind of all over the place right now. Like, my girlfriend's kid is also driving me up the wall. It's hard to become a parent, like, yeah. all of a sudden. And while that's not stated to cult actually it is probably something that later does come up because then she realizes like his co-worker his colleague recognizes oh wait that was an illusion and that was not actually cult and calls him and presumably talks to him about it and then it's later that you see that in the end scenes of the family including cult that he does seem to be more integrated in the family and like he and Ian have some banter and like he seems to be making more of an effort to be considerate of them as a cohesive family unit. Whereas I think before he was a little oblivious, like I don't think he was maliciously knocking their shit over, but he was a horse in a house built for elves. Yeah. And like not necessarily being careful to not disrupt that situation through carelessness. But I think the other side of that is that the officers have that conversation with Ian and Barley. Mm -hmm. um, And it might be a reminder to them that this guy is not just your mother's boyfriend. He Mm -hmm. is coming into your household in this role. Um, Right. And And he cares about you. Yeah. Yeah. Because he does clearly care about them. Like, he's worried about them as he's trying to find them, not just because he knows it will upset Laurel, but because he's worried about them. Yeah. And as the child of a blended family like i appreciate a more sensitive portrayal of a step parent who's coming into a household and it's a it's a difficult difficult line to walk between respecting that you're not the children's original parent and that their remaining parent does have veto power and should be the first authority but also having to figure out a good balance of authority in the household that's still sensitive to the weird role you're occupying. Yeah. Um, and we should have a, a, a loud shout out to the LGBT representation in a Pixar film there. Um, yes. As the officer that's talking about her girlfriend's kid is... A female officer, which apparently caused the movie to not be shown in some country. I can't remember. Somewhere ended up like censoring it, which is just stupid, but... Uh, the world. What can you do? Uh, no Good on Pixar doing that despite knowing that it would probably cause problems with some of their international revenue. We applaud and approve. Yes. So we mentioned the whole thing with Colt having a car despite the fact that he can run at 70 miles an hour. Well, if he wants to. If, if he, he to. if he trains to it. You know, he probably couldn't immediately after relying on a car his whole career. But 
But that sort of brings us into the whole issue of the magic versus technology conversation that goes on. As you're shown at the beginning a world that only has magic and doesn't have technology. And then the main body of the film takes place in a world where really the only person doing magic seems to be Ian. Yeah, and like the pixies are using like an entire cloud of them to drive single motorcycles. Like they drive several motorcycles, but it takes several of them to power a single one when it seems way more intuitive and much easier to just fly when you have the capacity to do that. Um, yeah, and Barley has a conversation where he's trying to explain this to them. You know, your ancestors could fly, and the pixie's like, "No, no, no these wings are too small for that." Which I think is a commentary on something else. But, well, and um, well, and the pixie's like, "What do you are you telling me? I'm stupid because I don't know how to, you know, use my own wings or whatever." And he's like, "No, it's your ancestors." Like, what did you say about my ancestors? And like, they're very offended. Yeah. Um, but it's more of a case of a lot of this knowledge has been lost because it wasn't prioritized once technology that was usable by anybody of any magical species could use. Yeah. I think that that is a note to like some of the fantasy creatures that you see where people look at it and go, those wings couldn't actually support a creature of that size. Uh, I think there's um, Greedo in Phantom Menace or something. Mm. One of those ones. So I think that uh, the pixies are like... Partially like, no, 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 that wouldn't work because the wings are too small is, is a nod to that. Mm. And it's not until they're in a situation where they would die if they didn't fly that they, like, I guess their instincts take over and their, I guess their fight, their fight or flight response uh... <laughs> kicks in and they are able to shake out pixie dust and fly. And then they realize, oh shit, we can fly. And it kind of changes everything for them. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they they're still act like a bike again. But... Yes, but they don't actually have to maneuver all these giant bikes in, like, synchrony of 20 of them, which I'm sure... At that point, like, that's basically, like, crewing a ship. Yeah. When you actually have the ability to just swim at several knots per hour, like... I could see being like, oh, wow, this is much more trouble than it's worth. So, yeah, we we get a few spots like that where it's like, oh, we've become reliant on technology instead of using our magical abilities to do things. The Manticore is also like, oh, you know, like I kind of haven't been putting in the wing exercises, so I can't fly anymore. And and she can fly when she's pushed to it. Mm -hmm. She does kind of throw her back out. She does, but she's a few hundred years old by our reckoning. (laughs) And she's also been fighting a dragon that's made out of a curse and a school. Yes. If that makes make sense to you, go and watch the film. It's and a ridiculous easier. dragon mural. Uh, that thing. And I mean, within, as far as a commentary upon our own culture, that starts to walk a very delicate line where you're talking about technology versus innate ability. I certainly get very frustrated with the things that you'll see going around online talking about how, oh, you know, we get too focused on our phones and it stops communication and everything. We can rebut this a million times over, whether it's a picture of a from the 20s of, an entire bus full of people reading their newspapers and refusing to Mm -hmm. talk to anyone Mm -hmm. or whether it's the fact that if i'm sitting there staring at my phone i probably am being social i'm just being social with someone who lives in luxembourg and not you because we'd rather talk to the person in luxembourg uh and you're the kind of person that shares shitty memes about technology technology is an important thing and it also helps with accessibility in a lot of things did you want to take over on some of this some of this is your point i think Yeah. Uh, yeah and i definitely think it's important to note that it, it's very dangerous to come down very hard on advances in technology coming into widespread use because of the accessibility issue and you can get very ableist with that really quickly. I think it's similarly dangerous with like the whole plot of The Incredibles, which is another movie that I love, but the fact that Syndrome is trying to make superpowers something that anyone can do, I think is amazing. Like, Think of the accessibility challenges that would be overcome if everyone could levitate or fly and lift incredibly heavy things. I mean, we've built so many tools to enable us to do things that we wouldn't be able to do even if we were in the peak of physical training or whatever. And But also, a lot of inventions have been developed to enable people with specific disabilities the capacity to fully participate in the world. One of the things that I think a lot of people don't realize is there are a lot of those products that are marketed with these kind of insulting infomercials where there, you have some cartoonishly inept people. Um, Just smashing eggs on the counter. and Right. And the whole thing is like, it's laughable to people who 
do not need those devices. But a lot of that stuff is actually developed for people with disabilities and mobility issues who do need that kind of assistive device in order to handle what would be an easy everyday task for most other people. But because the population of people who does legitimately need the device is comparatively small, it's too small for the device to make money if they're only manufacturing and selling to that small group of people. So they have to try and market it to people who don't need it, resulting in these ridiculous over-the-top infomercials. And so it's very frustrating for people to be like, oh, you know, who needs that thing where you put your foot on it and it puts your socks on for you? Uh, A lot of people with serious diabetes and mobility problems. Those are the people that need that stuff. Yep. You know, who needs this device that lets you do some fine motor control task that anyone can do? People who have fine motor control stuff going on that makes it hard for them to do something like cook eggs or whatever. And so when you start bashing those kinds of technological tool advances, even though they look silly to an abled person, you're also minimizing the difficulty and the struggle and the need for help um, that a lot of people in a situation you can't imagine are having to deal with every day. So yeah, I think it, it can be dangerous to go overboard with a unilateral condemnation of like widespread adoption of different technology. I agree with you on the communication thing, but also with like just physical stuff too. Yeah. Um, Not everyone can walk for a couple of hours to get to the store. Cars are an important thing for a lot of people. Um, You know, my brother can't walk very, very far a lot of days just because of his health stuff. So while I might be able to go to a store that's a few blocks away and not drive, I certainly wouldn't expect him to do that regularly. Yeah. Yeah. But I think they do strike a fairly good balance in the film. There's certainly a suggestion that people have become too reliant upon technology, but and that they do need to sort of exercise some of their own skills or like um, sort of their innate abilities that they've Mm -hmm. forgotten that they have rather than relying on it in that way. But I think we get a very nice symbol of how it doesn't have to be one or the other at the end with the new van that Mm -hmm. they get to replace Guinevere in that... They're still taking the van to somewhere, school, store, wherever it is. But they also use magic to make it fly because you can make your van fly. Why wouldn't you? Right, And that way they're both able to go together because of the van. They're enclosed in a single object. Yeah. Well, I also appreciate that like they're in a van, but Colt runs to yeah. work because he doesn't need the car for this. Like There might be a situation where he would need his patrol car. Like if he knows if he's responding to somewhere where he's going to have to arrest somebody and detain them. I mean, it would probably make him fairly vulnerable and like to being attacked if he tried to get that person to ride on his back. I could see that maybe being a problem. So you might want your car for that. But if you're just heading to work for like a normal day, yeah, you probably can just leave your car at the precinct and like run there and back and use it when you need it sort of a thing. Yeah. Similarly with the pixies, like, you don't see them with their bikes anymore, but they are still, as you say, like, acting like a biker gang and acting in teams to carry other stuff, but they're flying stuff around. Yeah. You do get a slight extension of that sort of criticism of some of the modern culture side of things with uh, the Manticore's Tavern. (laughs) Yeah. Um, we, We touched on it very briefly earlier, but where the Manticore has become so concerned in liability claims and everything that it's not a place filled with adventurers and such now, and is instead kids' birthday parties everywhere. And when suggested that, you know, they... She helped someone go on a quest, she's concerned about liability things. Getting sued. Um, it's covered that the reason that she ended up pawning her curse crusher sword because she had ran some troubles with the taxes at one point and and when sort of she pointed out who she used to be and who she is now she has this sort of what did i become moment and kicks everyone out and destroys the tavern yep burns it down and literally she, sets it on fire with yep. her breath but she she goes away has a bit of an adventure and when she comes back she does reopen it and it is a more adventurous and dangerous place But it is still also a host to kids' birthday parties. It's just that now the cake is cut with a very large curse crusher sword. So again, it's that sort of blending of old and new and sort of not forgetting who you were side of things. 
Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. Like, she became too absorbed in the mundanity of tech-based modern life. Yeah. And forgot what magic was and what quests were and how to have an adventure and was reminded of the thrill of taking a risk and not necessarily knowing if it's going to work out and realized that that was something that added an important dimension to her life and was an important part of who she was, like her own self-concept of herself that she didn't want to lose again. Yeah. So I think the last thing that I wanted to touch on with this one is another storytelling element. And it's just the amount of work that they put into making the film a cohesive unit where there's not really any detail misplaced. It all builds to something later, mostly during the sort of big final showdown and the epilogue. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, you mentioned earlier there's the bit with the mother like doing her workout in the morning at the start that's like, I am a powerful warrior, and mm-hmm. then she's running up the back of a dragon holding mm-hmm. a sword later and says the same thing again. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's that nice callback. I, of course, don't have a list of the callbacks that I want to talk about here. But... Well, I think the most obvious one, aside from the I am a powerful warrior one, is all of the different spells that Ian uses. He learns them one by one over the course of the road trip with Barley, where Barley is has handed him the essentially like the player's handbook for D and D like that, that has all the spells in it and like what you need to perform those spells, but with a lot more details that I remember being in our player's handbook. <laughs> um, I don't remember anything about hearts fire or rules about lying or any of that, but so he learns them one by one during the journey and then ends up using them all, you know, at the same time in that same fight, like not simultaneously, but one after the other and they're all necessary in order for him to do what he needs to do to defeat the Cursed Dragon and enable his brother to have those final moments with their dad. Yeah. I mean, there's other little things as well, like uh, he loses his mage staff, Mm -hmm. but throughout the entirety of the film, people keep getting splinters off of it. Mm -hmm. So he's able to pull a splinter of the staff out of his hand and enlarge it to the size of a staff. Mm -hmm. Ridiculous, but also well thought out and planned. Mm -hmm. But I think that's also really nice because it's him no longer relying on something that he got from someone else. It's Mm. something he's made his own. He, he He got something from his father... And then he turned it into something that was entirely his, which is, I think it matches very well. Like he literally got half his genes from his father and probably the magical ability because his father wrote a spell and gave them a wizard staff. He probably also had magical powers. So he got something, he got a gift from his father. And then even though he lost his father and even though he lost what his father passed down to him to be able to use it, he himself was able to do it by himself. Yeah. Along that same line, I think that also works very well with the fact that he doesn't try to get the staff that was his father's when it falls into the sea. And you mentioned when we were talking about this before, like, that you were surprised he doesn't try to retrieve it, like, at least after the battle. Because later you see his staff propped up by the door of the house, but you don't see the one they got from their dad. And I think that it works better this way because he's let go of... This idea of his father and mentally relying on that idea, he is able to draw strength on his own at this point. Hmm. That's an interesting point in the. there's also, like this This is not related to the things throughout the film, but there's um, the sweatshirt that he wears at the mm. beginning that was his dad's sweatshirt, mm-hmm. and he, like, it gets torn somehow. I can't remember how exactly. Barley tears it somehow, I think. Yeah, and it's sort of like this... I know, there's a weakness to this image of his father, but he's patching it back together again later with his sewing skills that his mother taught him. So, and that's a nice mm-hmm. metaphor along with it. I think there's a, like, it's a very simple plot, but it has been very well put together. I, I mean, we could try and come up with a list with all the uh, nice little background things, but I think if you just go and watch the film, you'll pick up a good number of them. Watch it twice. Why not? Yeah. Well, also, there's the, the... What else do you have to do? There's the silly and obvious one where, like, they have the final showdown across the street from their high school and the cursed dragon constructs its body out of the school which has a mural of a dragon on it a very silly cartoonish mural of a dragon and ends up constructing itself such that the face panel is the part that has the goofy dragon face on it um they show you that like you know cartoonish silly dragon in this remnant of a world that used to have magic at the very beginning of the movie when he goes to school and then it comes back around and is a real dragon yeah also the uh the headlight for guinevere 
Um, yeah. Or a turn signal, like the turn signal light, the small amber light, um, when Barley sacrifices his car to stall their pursuit so they can continue on the quest for the Phoenix Gem, the only thing that kind of falls back toward them is the little amber turn signal light, which looks similar to a Phoenix Gem, which I noted at the time and wondered if maybe it was somehow a Phoenix Gem or if that would be relevant later. And then he, Barley does pull it out of his pocket and use it as a diversion to get the dragon to go away from Ian at one point. Yeah. Um, so that, too, comes around full circle. Like, that's him having destroyed his car and kept that memento ends up also being critical in the final showdown. And it looking like the Phoenix Gem. Yeah. So I think that covers most of the things that we want to talk about here. But I think that the big question we need to ask is, what does the film say about death, grieving, and processing all of that? I think part of what this movie is getting at in terms of the way like it's handling grief and like processing having lost someone and like never being able to have them in your life again is that you can't really make new memories with that person, but you can recontextualize and add to your idea of them with other people who knew them. Does that make sense? Like, you yourself can't really have new experiences with that person, but you, that doesn't mean you can't have new experiences about them that help you kind of process and understand them more fully and understand their role in your life yeah. more fully. Because Ian can never meet his father. He can never have a memory with his dad. That's just with his dad. He can only develop memories mediated by Barley and his mom and other people who knew his dad. They can tell him about him, and that can sort of construct an idea for him and he can think about what he would have wanted but it's never going to be the same it's not going to be what he wants it to be and he has to come to terms with that you know that he's never just going to have that yeah i wonder how that fits in with what the narrative says about barley's grieving process i think i mean that makes sense it's the things that he does get to experience with the legs are things he already experienced the playing the drums on the feet and, like, yeah. the silly dancing and things like that. Because they can't really have a new conversation. I mean, they kind of do at the end, but it's very brief and we don't get to see it. And I do think it's important that we don't get to see it. Yeah. Like, all he can do is say goodbye. And that's something that he could do at any time. It just it has been hard for him to do without, like, a moment and a context where it seemed appropriate and meaningful. Yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a fair point that you make, because, I mean, things like when there's the dancing scene and the legs are dancing, Ian's reaction is, what is going on? Mm -hmm. And Barley's going, I think he can hear the music. I think that's his dancing. And he can feel the vibration. Like, yeah. Ian is able to enjoy that, as you say, only because Barley is able to give it context. And Barley dances with the legs and behind the legs to construct a full body. To show Ian what this must look like. And what a father looks like. Right, exactly. Yes. And I think that that is in very... In I think it's intentional that all of those things are mediated by other people who knew their dad. The socks. Like, he, he's wearing socks and that's only meaningful to Ian because someone else told him it was a characteristic of their dad. Yeah. In the credits, his name is Wildin Lightfoot, which is what um, he's he tells Barley his wizard name would be. W wild in the wild in the whips whimsical. the whimsical yeah. yeah so it's it's not even like a a different a totally different name it's just like a, an appellation uh characterization that's silly that also is consistent with what other people have told Ian about their dad that he was the sort of person who wore whimsical socks yeah and was the sort of person who, in an era where everyone was relying on technology, wrote a spell for his boys to see him one more time. Like, that's a whimsical person. It's still not any new information. It's just a new permutation of things that he has filtered from other people. Yeah, I mean, as far as, like, the question of death and grieving, I think there's a, there's a potentially callous reading of it that suggests that, like, the message is that you move on and live with what you've got. But I think that it's probably more about the about the ability to have a connection because of a shared loss there. Mm -hmm. I think it, I think it's definitely that. But also, I'm trying to figure out the best way to kind of put this. I think when you're processing grief, it can be very hard to look beyond what you no longer have and can never have to see the support that you do have, and that's 
okay, that's totally healthy and important, like, to be able to process and let go of the things that you are never going to have and you thought you would have. And you're, you're fundamentally changing your expectation of the world and your future when you lose somebody who is important in your life. And which is different for Ian, because he never knew his dad. For him, it's more, he's getting a bunch of messages about what he should have had. And so he's feeling deprived of something that other people get to have that he never had. But because he was looking so hard at that, at this idea of what was quote unquote supposed to be in his life, that he has missed what he does have until the end. And then he is able to see the support that his older brother has been for him his whole life so that he doesn't feel the loss of a paternal figure in the same way that Barley must have felt it growing up. Because Barley didn't have an older brother. He had their mom, who was also probably grieving for a while, you know, during a period of time where she may not have... I'm sure she was... It seems like she did a great job of raising them, but I'm sure there were times when she didn't have the emotional bandwidth to notice or necessarily be as supportive as someone else who was not grieving might have been for him. If it had been, say, like, the loss of a close friend or something that was less of an impact to his mom. So he had to deal with that stuff with their mom in a way that Ian didn't have to because they were going through it together, but there wasn't anyone additionally that we see. Or maybe, who knows, maybe her parents were really involved or something. We don't know. But point being, Barley being a little older than Ian was always sort of there to sort of be a buffer and a bit of a shield for him. Yeah. Where he didn't really have that similarly in a paternal figure in a, like a male role model sort of a way like Ian has. Like Ian had a nurturing and protective male role model in his life that Barley probably didn't really have. It's a joint process. Oh, I'm just extracting from that back to grieving. Yeah. But so Ian, I think Ian was just too focused on what he felt the world owed him in a way. Mm. But it was because it's something he never had. It's not something he could really understand. And when he comes to understand what he was looking for, he realizes he already had it. Yeah. You know, we didn't talk about this before, but I think it's interesting that Barley looks so much like their mom and Ian looks so much like their dad. Yeah. Like, in build and facial features. And so I think in a way, Ian is also probably looking to know more about someone that he's often compared to, that he has no way of knowing, like, in a meaningful sense. Yeah. That's fair. Do we actually have an answer for the question in this? I know. I think going back to the question, like, what are they saying about death and grief and loss. I think that like anything that's about this, it's complicated and it can be messy, but also that you, there's no going back. You can't undo it. You can't undo death. Ian never does get to see his father after he's died. His father died before he's born and he's never able to meet him. There's nothing he can do about that. Barley gets to say goodbye, but he always had the chance to say goodbye if that makes sense. Yeah. He didn't get an opportunity he'd never had before, if that makes sense. Yeah, he just got to do it with someone in front of him. Right. Yeah. I think that's fair. So I think that's an answer to the big question. I think the bigger question is, is Ian a wizard or a sorcerer? I mean, it depends on the definition you go for. I mean, the real problem here is that we don't know the exact rules of this universe. If we apply D&D logic then he's a sorcerer because he does have to have the innate ability, but a wizard because he has to learn the spells. But he learns the spells very easily, so probably a sorcerer. But what's he called within the film? Like, what is someone who uses magic called in the film? Well, they call, they say, oh, Dad was a wizard? And, like, they assume that he was a wizard. And it's probably a wizard, then. Well, he did write the spell, so I don't know that sorcerer. I think that's more of a magical study and, like, theorizing and putting stuff together. I I don't know. more wizardy, but... I don't know that sorcerers canonically exist within the Onward universe. That's the real problem. Here. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I do think it leans more toward wizard. I just have some problems with Ian just suddenly being able to do magic immediately with that. I mean, they they do seem to only show wizards doing magic because, like, in the setup at the beginning of the world, that's kind of the whole point is that it's really difficult and, like, you have to practice and it's you know, kind of pain in the ass, and that's why the guy is just like, oh my god, just someone invented the light switch, light switch way easier than this light-producing spell that I've been trying and failing at for hours. So, you make a good point about them not really showing uh, canonical sorcerers in this universe, and so probably a wizard, but 
If so, he's got to be some sort of like wizard prodigy. Oh, it's really good stuff. Or Barley's um, bardic inspiration is just really effective. Yeah. That was one thing I did want to mention earlier with the Barley stuff and like coming back around. You have the first time that he tries to use the Phoenix Gem to bring their father into existence in the room. He's struggling to hold it and Barley runs to try and help and knocks him over. Mm -hmm. And then when he's using it the second time around, the same problem comes around. But that time Barley is able to come up and like help and stop him from stumbling. Mm -hmm. um, and it's there working in much more cohesion at that point. Well, he's so. holding him steady, right? Isn't that yeah. what it is? Rather than trying to fix it, he is helping Ian do what he needs to do. Yeah. I thought it was a nice moment. It is a nice moment. And it turns right back around where then Ian helps Barley do what he needed to do with saying goodbye to their father. Yeah. By holding the dragon off while Barley says goodbye. Yeah. Shall we move on to fun facts and interesting tangents? Sure. Do you have any fun facts or interesting tangents? I was just looking one up. So I was wondering where the uh, where the Pixar A113 turns up in this. Mm -hmm. In wall -E, it does appear in one of the things. I think we mentioned it in the episode for that. It's not seen in the film, but when the police officers get on the radio at one point, they say a 113 in progress. Ah, that's clever. Do you want to do yours? Sure. Mine's more of an interesting tangent. So I watched the Super Carlin Brothers video on how Onward might fit into the Pixar theory. Mm. And I'm not totally sure I'm convinced, but it's an interesting idea. So... What their video talks about is the idea that Onward takes place on one of the planets that one of the, by and large, ships ends up crash landing on, because they all are out there still. Only one ship is shown to have returned to Earth, and presumably the other ones must go somewhere eventually, and points out that the shape of Raven's Point, the mountain, is about right in configuration for if one of those cruise liners crashed, like, nose down. The way that the point's configuration works, like, lines up sort of, not, like, perfectly, but pretty well, and that that might explain the rapid rise of technology in the Onward universe, as the ship would have been a ridiculous source of information and technological advancement because mm. we know that the ship's computers when you ask it questions can explain lots of stuff to you and so that might have explained a vastly accelerated advancement in technology in that world and also might explain why there's triple dent gum in the convenience store which is something that you see in Inside Out, if it's a thing that by and large makes and was something that they found out about through interaction with the ship's computer, and mm. that jingle, maybe if it got in everyone's head or something, um, as we know, it's very catchy from Inside Out, like maybe someone recreated it in that universe, and that could explain why it's there. I don't know, like, the silhouette is not quite right, and they're like, I mean, it doesn't look like a crashed ship, but it's like, yes, but if that was hundreds of years ago, and, like, nature has sort of, like, grown over it, etc., like, it's gotten kicked with things. Like I said, I don't know that I totally buy it, but it's an interesting idea. I'd have to look at the pictures. Um, it does raise a certainly mildly concerning aspect of that, which is if that, like, presumably that means that, like, this ship crashed in a place where the other people already lived. There were already fantasy creatures here who could do magic. Mm -hmm. And then the ship crashed and there was technology. Mm -hmm. Where are the humans? I think that the theory is that there weren't survivors. Oh, okay. It's just that they discovered all the technology. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's that's still pretty grim, but sure. Yes. I mean, it is a movie about death, though. Uh, <laughs> that would explain why it's very clearly a different planet. As you know, there's the two moons, like we talked about before. And yet still has triple dent gum in the convenience store and, like, what appear to basically be iPhones and the same sort of architecture that you see in, like, any suburban high school and all of that stuff, you know? Yeah, that's fair. How they somehow also have recognizable stoner vans, like airbrush drawings on it. The, the other fun fact that I have is that when they're paying the toll at the Troll Bridge, mm -hmm. yeah, we'll stick with that phrasing, you can see a Pizza Planet truck in the background. Ah, well, there you go. As in from Toy Story. Yes. Which would also, like, it's weird that there's Triple Dent Gum and Pizza Planet stuff if it's a different planet, but not if they're inspired to make a lot of these things because of things they saw from Earth. Yeah, although the, 
The thing, well, I mean, they'd have to have, like, gone through and watched the history of it. Because, by and large, it's taken, like, I don't think there's a pizza planet. I think there's a, by and large, pizza place in Wally. If there were a pizza place, then I think that's what it would be. And they, it doesn't seem like a civilization that's massively concerned with its own history. So I would be surprised if they were that interested in the history of this spaceship. I don't know. It could be one of those weird things that just happens when, you know, archivists are just going down rabbit holes of questions for the ship computer. Maybe it's um, parallel evolution. Hmm. And just like, just an innate nature to create yeah. triple dent gum. <laughs> innate nature to create Pizza Planet. Okay, well, that's silly. Um, I think that we can probably wrap up for this week there. Was there any other fun facts? Uh, I didn't have any, did you? While we were talking about Super Carlin Brothers videos about Onward, I don't think I actually watched this video, but I saw before, months ago, they had a video that was speculating that maybe Onward was happening in Andy's imagination, Andy from Toy Story, um, partially because Ian and Andy look similar in terms of their animation. In the recent one of How It Fits in the Pixar Theory, they seem to have decided, no, probably not, but like the idea is like it's a story he's written because we know he has an active imagination and things like that. Like As an adult, like he's written this story. Interesting. I think another thing was like because his dad died when he was young. And stuff mm. That may have been part of him processing that loss. I haven't seen Toy Story 3 and 4, but he doesn't have a brother, though. No, but he has a little sister. Yeah, I don't know. I, that seems like a stretch. Yeah, potentially. And the, it, they do seem to have decided that it is a stretch um, in the How It Fits in the Fix Our Theory most recent video, at having actually watched the film. But I figured it was worth pointing out that that was also a theory floating around for a while before the movie actually debuted. Okay, so are we good? I think so. Okay, we are playing a little bit by ear on what our schedule is going to be for the next couple of episodes, so you sort of have to find out and be surprised when they post. Unlike all those other times when we're really great about keeping you posted on exactly what our upcoming episodes will be and when they'll be posted. I feel called out. Sometimes we, sometimes we manage it. If you would like to see those updates that sometimes we keep to, you can find us on social media. The links for all of those are in our show notes. Um, if you have any questions, suggestions, recommendations, or want to contribute to the discussion in any other way, you can email us at unramblingspodcast at gmail.com, or you can use the hashtag unramblings on social media and we will do our best to respond to you. You can also send us direct messages through social media, but the email address is there for a reason. So, But we spent a lot of time on the email address, so go ahead and use that. I mean, we didn't spend a lot of time. We took spent like 45 seconds. Um, cool. Thank you for listening to Unramblings. We hope you join us next week and stay safe. How does the cult laurel sex life thing work? I'm, I can't say I have not wondered about it. I tried not to wonder too hard. That's, that's fair. Um, um, that's probably a key part of it.